Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, we do have a few announcements uh, that we'll get through just as people make their way in uh, following lunch. Um, my name is Kelly Dowdell. I am a proud supporter of the Parkland Institute and a member of its board of directors. Uh, welcome all of you back uh, from your lunch break. I hope it was delicious. Uh, we'd like to start this afternoon uh, just by acknowledging our sponsors again. For those of you who, who were here last night, you will have heard it, but for all you newbies, uh, here we go. So we've received uh, fun and sponsorship from the following organizations and of course a conference like this as all of you know uh, couldn't function without that support. So the uh, Alberta Federation of Labor, the Health Sciences Association of Alberta, <laughs> They've got, they brought their own fan club. Uh, QP Alberta, United, United Nurses of Alberta, uh, the Civic Services Union, uh, the Non-Academic Staff Association, the U of A Faculty of Arts, Alberta Views Magazine, Athabasca University, uh, Woodsworth Irvine Socialist Fellowship Scholarship, uh, the TAI uh, View Weekly, and CJSR, who are, of course, our media sponsors. Um, one quick thing as well, uh, you'll notice in your conference program that you do have a conference feedback form. Um, in particular, they're wondering how lunch was and uh, if there were enough food choices for people uh, for the different variety of dietary needs, including uh, vegan diets and other dietary restrictions. So if you have feedback on whether or not we should have more of those offerings, um, if it was sufficient for those of you who require those, those types of meals, um, or on the variety of the food in general, um, please make sure that you include that in your feedback form, as well as your feedback on all of our amazing sessions that have happened today. Um, when I was asked to facilitate a session, I of course said yes right away. And then I went quickly to the website to look through the sessions to wonder which one I was gonna get. And I had my eye on this one in particular um, because the issues that uh, our speaker is going to address around some of these societal megatrends, you know, the decline in social capital, the growing income inequality, things that we've been talking about throughout the course of the weekend are things that have been on my mind, um, particularly in the past year, but uh, definitely over uh, the past few years as I've thought about my own work and um, what I'm contributing to making uh, our society a better place. So it's my pleasure. Uh, I had a chance to chat with uh, Professor Lewandowski over lunch, um, and it's my uh, pleasure to welcome him here. He is a cognitive science uh, scientist at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. Um, I won't read through his whole biography. You can read that in, uh, in the program, but the thing that really caught my eye when I was reviewing it uh, was that he was appointed a fellow of the Centre for Skeptical Inquiry for his commitment to science and rational inquiry and public education. Um, and so I'm really, really excited to hear what he has to say on the, uh, on the theme of the post-truth era and what that means for the state of our democracy and the state of our society. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thanks, it's a uh, pleasure to be here. Can you hear me, is the mic on? Yeah. Bit more, we need a bit more volume, thank you. Right, it's a pleasure to be here because I think we all agree that something is going on. Something out there is happening. And, but I'm not quite sure what it is. So, I asked a media search engine called Factiva to tell me what's going on out there. And I put in the keywords post-fact and post-truth. I did this about nine months ago. And what I found was this. No one knew what post-fact was until about a year and a half ago, two years ago. And then there's been this explosive growth of that term being bandied about in the media. And the same with post-truth. Even more rapid increase sometime late last year. So out of nowhere, we have entered post-fact, post-truth. And last year, post-truth was nominated as the word of the year for 2016 by Oxford Dictionaries. Now, that has become so 2016 recently because we now have a new word of the year, and that's fake news. Uh, nominated by Collins Dictionary. So something is happening out there. And I think what triggered this were two catastrophes last year, one known as Brexit, the second one known as Donald Trump. And what this 
graph is telling you is the verdict by independent fact checkers of the truthfulness of the two candidates in the presidential election last year. And if you only go as far as crediting Hillary Clinton with speaking something that's mostly true, she was mostly true more than half the time. And if you add half truth, give her credit for that, she spoke something resembling the truth three quarters of the time. Now, her opponent was either pants on fire lies, false or mostly false, about two thirds uh, of the time or even more. And since we all live in a rational world, you can tell from that who won the election. <laughs> Clearly, uh, the candidate who didn't speak the truth. And this goes on. Uh, this was updated a month ago. I'm getting tired of updating this all the time because it clicks over by five lies a day on average. But according to the Washington Post, President Trump has misspoken or misstated or made false claims uh, at the rate of about five per day since he was inaugurated. So that's the post-truth world. Or is it? Because here is a problem. The problem is this, that if you say post-truth, you're actually saying quite a lot. What you're actually saying, and the fancy word for that is an implicature, um, so I put it up there. I'm an academic. I have to put up these things. Uh, what you're really saying when you're saying post-truth is that you went from truth to post-truth. Otherwise, you can't have a post-truth. You're assuming there was a truth. <laughs> and it implies a fall from grace, as though the world was perfect. And then, whoa, here comes Brexit and Trump, and we're now post-truth. Well, that, I think, is overstating the case. Something else has gone on. Because, for example, I'm just showing you some data that speak against this fall from grace idea. Because at least in the UK, there are data suggesting that the public is trusting scientists more and more, not less and less. So that seeks, seems to go against this idea of a fall from grace. And of course, we have to recognize that there were untruths before post-truth. Uh, let me give you some example of those, because I think it's important to analyze what happened in the past and how that might differ from what's happening now. Here are some data. Uh, it's a very complicated table uh, about two claims. On top is the claim that President Obama was not born in the United States. And the bottom is that most scientists think that climate change is not occurring. So this is a claim that is completely counter to uh, the reality of the scientific consensus on climate change. And these are data from, they were published in 2010, so they were probably taken in 2008, 2009, so nearly 10 years ago. And what do you see? Well, what you see is something quite interesting. What you see is that the data differ dramatically between news outlets. The numbers in each cell represent the percentages of people who are endorsing this myth or that myth. So the bigger the number, the worse informed people are. Now, with Fox News, if you never watch it, you get away with being wrong 30% of the time. If you watch it almost every day, uh, your chance of being misinformed doubles to 60% or 63%. Now, the reverse is true for people who are watching public broadcasting, NPR, or PBS in the US. The more frequently you watch public broadcasters, the less likely you are to be misinformed, quite in contrast to Fox News. So what does that tell us? Well, it's difficult to infer from this uh, that Fox News is causing this, because these data are just an association, and we don't know what's causing what. But it's certainly a suggestive pattern. And it tells us that even eight or nine years ago, on some very important issues, a lot of people were misinformed. Here's another example. Remember the weapons of mass destruction a long time ago? Well, uh, 
They never existed, right? Well, they did exist to, to complicate matters, but not at the time when the Allies uh, invaded Iraq on the pretense that the weapons of mass destruction were there. I can say that with some confidence because it has become American government bipartisan consensus that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq around two years after the invasion. But now look at the data. What I'm showing you here are surveys from you know, 2006 through 2008, broken down by Republicans, Democrats, independents, and the dark gray and black bars represent the share of respondents who think that Iraq either had WMDs or had them, but the US was just not smart enough to find them. Uh, among Republicans, that belief persists at about 60%. Two in three, roughly, Republicans believed for years and years and years after the war that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, even though it was bipartisan consensus that there weren't any. So this myth persisted. That's an untruth. It persisted at a time when no one talked about post-truth. So if we're not post-truth, what post what exactly are we? Well, I think something has changed over the last few years. And what I think has changed is the type of misinformation, deception, and lies that we're being exposed to. This is a graph from a forthcoming paper by some colleagues of mine where they differentiate between different types of lies and misinformation. Uh, truthiness, bullshit, systemic lies, shock and chaos. <laughs> now, I think that's a really valuable differentiation. I'm less sure about the axis from the top to the bottom. I'm not quite sure that I agree with what they're talking about there. But I certainly agree with this axis from left to right. There is something about truthiness and systemic lies that notwithstanding of them being false, they lay claim to reality. The weapons of mass destruction story was meant to capture reality. It wasn't meant to be bullshit or a fairy tale. It was meant to be serious intelligence, even though it was false. But whereas today, um, strong constructivism, that's the academic term that translates into bullshit, uh, it just simply means you're making stuff up, uh, but without any apparent purpose, other than to just, you know, say these things. Trump just tweets stuff, uh, but it doesn't actually have seemingly a precise agenda. So what I think has been happening over the last uh, couple of years is that we've gone from a world in which there were lies, deceptions, all of that, but they were carefully curated. They were designed to achieve a purpose. The weapons of mass destruction was a campaign to create a war out of not that reason, wasn't weapons of mass destruction, but they used that to solicit support for that specific policy position. And importantly, those lies and deceptions were contesting the same reality. They were talking about Iraq. They were making claims about Iraq. Climate deniers are making claims about climate science, saying it's all corrupt and we're the real scientists. But they are contesting the same idea of science or reality. Whereas what we have now, more recently, is what some people have called epistemic insouciance. That means you just you don't give a shit about whether anything is true or not. You just make up your stuff. Alternative facts, remember that? Kellyanne Conway, yeah, OK. Oh, we have our alternative facts. That's a completely different epistemology. That means you're not contesting one reality, but you're replacing it with another one of your choice. And I think that that is the crucial difference and that we're not 
post-truth, but post-reality, post the stage where facts matter. How do I know that? Well, I'm speculating to some extent, but it's based on data. Here's one experiment I want to tell you about very briefly that uh, my colleagues and I ran recently, where we presented our participants online with statements that Donald Trump made on the campaign trail during the primaries. And he would sometimes say things that were wrong. Well, sometimes. I mean, he <laughs> often said things that were wrong. But he occasionally said things that were true. So we collected, harvested these statements, presented them to our participants, asked them first what they believed to be true or not. Then we corrected the false statements, affirmed the true statements, so provided feedback, and asked again, what do you think? What's true and false? And here are the data. Now, I want to draw your attention to the graph on the right. That's the one you can see. The other one I grayed out because it's not relevant today. And let's first ignore the color of the lines. Let's first notice that some of them are solid, some of them are broken. The solid lines are for true statements. The broken lines are for false statements. Now, up front, without any further explanation, the belief scores were sort of the same for both facts and misstatements. In fact, they were a little lower for misstatements, but not a hell of a lot. We then provided our corrections. So we said, hey, these are true, those are false. What happens? Well, people jump up onto the true statements, and they go down on the false statements. And a week later, that wears off a bit. That's called forgetting. You know, after a week, people are just no longer sure. But the point is, there is differentiation, there is discrimination between true and false statements. And the interesting thing is, if you now look at the color of the lines, the interesting thing is that this pattern of sensitivity to corrections is true for Trump supporters, Republican Trump opponents, as well as Democrats. The red lines solid or broken, are Trump supporters. The uh, purple are Republican opposers. This was during the primaries where there were still lots of Republicans opposing Trump. And the blue are the Democrats. Seems to be true for all of them. So where is the post-fact, post-truth, post-whatever? Where, where is it? Doesn't seem to be in these data. Well, it's not in these data, but it's in those data and a couple other things I'll tell you about. These are not data about belief in specific statements, but these are data showing us how people feel about Trump on the right and whether they want to vote for him on the left. And now look at what matters. The only thing that matters is whether people are supporting Trump, whether they were supporters ahead of time or not. If they support Trump, they'll vote for Trump. If they don't support Trump, they will not. Corrections, facts, none of that matters. In fact, the degree of belief change that we achieved with our correction was completely unrelated to any change in voting intentions uh, for Trump supporters. And that finding has been replicated uh, by others using a different methodology. We have replicated it ourselves recently in also a slightly different methodology. So I'm now pretty confident in saying that, well, you can correct people's misconceptions on individual facts, but that has no traction in the larger scheme of things, namely whether or not they want to vote for Trump. So I think we're post-realism, post where facts matter, not post-truth, because politicians have always sometimes spoken untruths. But now the authority of facts seems to have gone. And certainly in America, and I'm afraid to say also in the UK, uh, 
people share a belief system that is disconnected from what I would consider, or scientists would consider, a conventional understanding of facts or evidence. The weapons of mass destruction was a misconception you might have corrected. Trump is not something you can correct, because if he lies five times a day, you, you, you cannot keep up. No one can keep up with correcting this and understanding what's going on. And in my opinion, that is precisely the point. It is precisely the point to create a blizzard of stuff that people sort of give up on uh, the knowability of facts. And this is the striking thing. These are exit poll data from the day after the election published by the New York Times. Now, it's a complicated graph. But basically, people were asked whether Clinton or Trump are honest and trustworthy. And those people who said that Clinton is trustworthy, 94% of those people voted for her. Of the people who thought Trump was trustworthy, 94% voted for Trump. And those who said, no, I can't trust Clinton, only 20% voted for Clinton. Those who said no to Trump, only 21% voted to him. But notice something? There's complete symmetry in those numbers, quite unlike what the fact checkers were saying. So the fact checkers are saying, whoa, you know, there's Clinton, there's Trump, they're incredibly different. But when you talk about trustworthiness and the implications for people's votes, you find complete symmetry. <coughs> Slightly more people voted for Clinton than Trump, but the difference is actually rather small. And the people who voted for Trump, well, look at it, uh, most of them thought that he was he was trustworthy, despite all the fact-checking and everything. So that's why I'm claiming that there are two alternative realities. Here's one quote by a person who said this before me. We live in two universes. One universe is a lie. The other universe is where we are, and that's where reality reigns supreme and we deal with it. Guess who said that? Him. Rush Limbaugh said that. Now, if you don't know Rush, uh, he has postulated that the world involves four corners of deceit, helpfully shown in a circle, government, academia, media, and science. Those are the four corners of deceit. Now, that's not just Rush Limbaugh. These are some recent survey data just a few months ago of Americans, Republicans on the left, Democrats on the right. What I'm showing you here are their responses to um, whether or not colleges and universities have a positive or negative effect on how the country is going. Now, what this is showing is that among, among Republicans in 2010, 58% thought universities are a good thing. Watch what happens. 2015, uh oh. 2017, only one in three Republicans think universities and colleges are a good thing for America. And leaning negative, saying that they are a bad thing for America, that's gone up to 58%. We're now in a situation where in the Republican Party, the vast majority of people think universities and colleges are a bad thing for the United States. Well, Democrats look different, not surprisingly, perhaps. But that is not just misinformation. This is an alternative reality in which one of the major parties in the United States, by a strong majority, is rejecting the idea that universities are good for uh, the country. So we have two claims to reality now. We have the scientists, academics, politifact, the fact checkers, maybe people in this room having one understanding of reality. And on the other hand, we have other people saying uh, the opposite. But they do so 
by invoking the same language. The Washington Post is talking about false and misleading claims. Uh, what does Donald Trump do? He's accusing CNN of fake news. Fake news has become Trump's battle cry. Everybody else is printing fake news when they're identifying my lies. It's complete rhetorical symmetry. And that is why I think what we're really in right now is a world in which uh, the type of lies and deceptions and misstatements that have been uh, disseminated or are being disseminated by politicians are, are of a type that, that is perhaps unprecedented because they're no longer curated to serve a purpose. They're just out there to create an alternative reality in which the only thing that matters is what the leader is saying and proclaiming to be true. And to my mind, there is some literature in political science on this that authoritarians and fascists engage in that kind of disinformation simply because it makes facts unknowable to anyone but the most dedicated geek who is going through all of Trump's statements and, and can identify which are false and which are true. And it is that that we're confronting. Now what? What are we going to do about it? Well, I think the first point to make, and I'm going to say this about 10 times over today, I apologize for the repetition, but this to my mind is a very important point. Rhetorical symmetry does not imply substantive symmetry. Just because Trump is talking about fake news and accuses CNN of that doesn't mean that CNN is producing fake news. It depends on something other than claims. There has to be an independent anchoring of uh, how we evaluate those rhetorical claims. And just to be perfectly clear here, I'm uh, convinced that universities, by and large, produce knowledge with imperfection at times, but at least we try. Whereas Rush Limbaugh produces, by and large, misinformation. I mean, this is another PolitiFact scorecard. Three quarters of what he says is either pants on fire, false, or mostly false. Occasionally, he, well, 5% of the time he says things that are mostly true. 5% of the time. <laughs> the rest of the time, it's somewhere between half true and completely wrong. Now, to me, that's a big difference between what universities do and what Rush Limbaugh says. And yet, he's the one claiming to be in reality, in the same way that scientists claim that we have access to reality. So there is a complete disconnect between the rhetoric and the substance of people's claims. And I think we have to recognize that, that just because there is rhetorical symmetry does not mean that there is substantive symmetry. Now, I want to illustrate this with a case study from climate science um, for two reasons. Number one, to underscore this idea that uh, rhetorical and substantive symmetry can be completely dissociated. And number two, because I want to draw your attention to a way in which we can escape this he says, she says, claim and counterclaim culture. And the way I want to do that is by telling you about a study, uh, two studies, well, I published two, I'll tell you about one, uh, that I published last year in which I conducted a blind test of the arguments used by climate contrarians. Now, um, what's a blind test? Well, let me explain it to you by giving you an example first of how contrarians operate, climate deniers, whatever you want to call them. Here's an op-ed from The Guardian. Even The Guardian isn't immune to this sort of blabber, where um, this individual was saying, Ooh, here's a slightly inconvenient truth. Over the past two years, the global sea level hasn't increased. It has slightly decreased. In other words, 
let's not worry about anything. That's the tenor of this article. Um, because, yeah, it's all exaggerated. Sea levels haven't risen in two years. Now, when you look at the graph, it's kind of interesting. These are the actual sea level data. Now, most of you might detect that this is going up, <laughs> right? Uh, except in 1992, uh, no, it wasn't 1992, whenever he wrote it, the last two years, so 2006, 2007, yeah, it did blip down by two years. Of course it does. It's a, you know, there's some randomness here. There's jiggle, but it actually goes up. So what deniers tend to do is to focus on this particular little tiny anomaly and then make a claim uh, from there to the entire idea of sea level rise. That was just one example of many. What we did for this particular experiment I'm telling you about is to go through the media and the blogs and online sources, radio, the whole lot, and we sampled contrarian statements that we verified to be representative of their arguments. Okay? And we did this for a large number of uh, indicator variables. You know, sea level rise, global temperatures, Arctic ice, glaciers, you name it. We looked at it and we sampled what contrarians had to say. And then we did one crucial thing. We removed all references to climate change and replaced it with references to economic indicator variables, but left everything else verbatim the same. So here we have a claim about the lowest agricultural output of any year on record. Output is extremely low, blah, 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 the lowest agricultural output. Now, that statement initially referred to global temperatures, not agricultural output. But by converting it to something else, we took out all the politics, all the emotion, and we could show this statement together with the data. Here are the global temperature data, in case you haven't seen them recently. Uh, translate it again into this world agricultural output. And we asked our experts uh, to tell us whether the claim actually made sense in light of the data. So we showed them the claim, the data, and they had to make a judgment about whether or not that was accurate. And we combined these different items, there's a bunch of those, into a single score. And what we find is this. Now, you can ignore the six pairs of bars on the left because they're all averaged into two bars over here on the right. And what you can see is that on average, the contrarian statements were judged to be misleading, untruthful, and unsuitable for policy advice by our statisticians who didn't know that they were evaluating claims about climate data. They thought it was about economic data. And in contrast to that, I didn't mention this before, we had a comparison condition in which the statements about the data were those that are made by climate scientists and the IPCC. And they were judged to be accurate and worthy of being taken seriously. So, in this blind test, uh, contrarian statements fail to be recognized as valid. They're revealed to be unsuitable and misleading. Now, that is crucial because we have other data. Uh, I don't have time to explain them in detail, but by colleagues of mine, showing that when people are exposed to these contrarian statements, misstatements about the data, that is not inconsequential because people reduce their belief in uh, the science and in the need to do something about the problem. So what this blind test shows us is that the public is being denied the right to be accurately informed about the risks we're facing from climate change. And I can now make that claim without falling into this rhetorical symmetry because I have a blind test where 
I'm not talking about claims and counterclaims, but I'm asking experts to tell me how accurate the statements are about data that they think are on a very different issue. So, not all opinions deserve to be balanced. Uh, and you're not, in fact, entitled to your opinion. <laughs> no, unless you can support it by argument, evidence, or fact. And that, and that, to my mind, is an important lesson, not just from my study, but generally an extremely important lesson uh, if we want to ever get out of this post-truth or post-realism situation. So what are we going to do? Having said all that, I have a little bit of time left. Let me walk you through what I think are the important factors that can help us overcome this problem. Now, the first thing I'm going to say quite clearly here is that we must have a goal. And to me, the goal is sort of encapsulated in this famous quote by Moynihan that everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. Uh, there, there's a lot more nuance to this than that. But as a first approximation for today, I think we should strive to achieve that. How do we do that? I may have said this before, but we got to recognize, first of all, that just because somebody is making rhetorical claims, that need not mean anything. They may just make stuff up. And I think we have to act on that basis. Now, the next thing we got to do is we got to look at how we actually got here. Because I think the historical trends underlying this are uh, quite relevant, quite important. And it turns out that I have a paper that's forthcoming or has just come out where we reviewed some of these mega trends, decadal trends, that arguably have contributed to this current crisis. Now, uh, what I'm showing you here are data from a freshman survey involving literally millions of young Americans. When they graduate from high school, they've been taking the survey ever since the 1960s. And you, know, you can't ignore this, because I think that's the background against which society is unfolding and against which claims to truth and facts and evidence are unfolding. So what do we find? OK, starting with a thick black line, in the 1960s, more than 80% of young Americans, one of their life goals was philosophy of life. OK, well, that didn't last very long. That has now gone down to around 50%. What's gone up is to be well off financially from 40% to now nearly double 80%. Being a leader has become important. Money has become important. There's been a shift across generations in what young Americans want out of life. Uh, at the same time, arguably, social capital has been declining. If you're looking at um, young Americans again, whether they trust institutions or government, that has declined. It was low to begin with. That's declined further. Uh, thinking about social problems, there's a lot of jiggle, but it's perhaps slightly downward trend. But importantly, what's really down is people's intent to help the environment. So there, there are downward trends on some indicator variables that um, collectively I refer to as social capital. And there's a lot of evidence to show that societies are more resilient to shocks and distortions if they have more social capital. Well, American society, and I apologize, I don't have data for Canada, but uh, in American society, arguably, that has been decreasing. What's been increasing is polarization. Of course, everybody knows that. Everybody is uh, uh, talking about polarization and how terrible it is. But what most people don't talk about is where did the polarization come from? Well, these are data going back to the late 19th century. 
um, by political scientists who applied a statistical, complicated statistical technique to decisions taken by um, the House of Representatives over that period, identifying uh, the position politicians took relative to their own earlier positions. And what you find is that, yes, there has been increasing polarization over the last 20 or 30 years, but that polarization is asymmetrical. The Republicans have moved to the right. Democrats have moved slightly to the left, but not nearly as much as Republicans have moved to the right. Polarization is asymmetrical. One of the drivers underlying this polarization, incidentally, is economic inequality. There's other evidence suggesting that Republican senators from more unequal states are far more extreme than their colleagues from less unequal states. And of course, polarization is the breeding ground for the creation of alternative realities. Because if you're that polarized, it's very difficult to maintain a common reality. But it's asymmetric. What's also asymmetric is the decline in trust in science. These are, again, decadal data last 40 years or so. Um, you can see two flat lines, the liberals up here, the moderates down there. That's maybe a little bit of a decline, but then it's been very flat. And there's one line that's declining. That is the open squares for conservatives. So since the mid-1970s, where conservatives and liberals didn't differ in how much they trust science or scientists, since then, the bottom has fallen out among conservatives, and they trust science less and less over time. And that's even though in the laboratory, we, we often find that conservatives and liberals don't differ in how they think, specifically on problems related to science. But in surveys in, involving actual scientific issues, there is a pervasive asymmetry. And I've been chasing science denial by the left for the last five or six years or more. And I have yet to find it in surveys. Because wherever you look, vaccinations, genetically modified organisms, AIDS, tobacco use, climate, and, you know, nuclear even. Even with nuclear, Democrats trust scientists more than Republicans do. There is a, a pervasive asymmetry. So we have to understand that. And then we have to ask maybe, just for fun, what drives policy in the US? Hey, it's a democracy, isn't it? Well, here's the democracy in action. What I'm showing you, and again, this is a, an analysis of thousands of political decisions taken by the House and the Senate combined, I think. And these researchers looked at the probability of a legislative measure being adopted as a function of public opinion. Percent favoring the proposed policy change. Ignore the histogram, just focus on the black line. If 10% of the American population wants something, well, 30% of the time they get it. If 90% of the American population wants something, they get it 32% of the time. So that difference is democracy between 0.3 and 0.32. Uh, so what matters, in addition to this strong effect of democracy? Well, here's something else. <laughs> These are the preferences of the economic elites on the exact same decisions, showing the probability of a legislative measure being adopted. If the elites don't want it, they don't have to worry, because they won't get it. It's as simple as that. If the elites agree that it's desirable, well, they're in luck, because two and three times that measure will be adopted. So this is what drives policy in the United States. Not public opinion, but by and large, elite preferences. 
which raises the question whether there is hope. What could we hope for? Well, and this is where things get to be interesting, because, because the Republican leadership specifically uh, matters a great deal in this. There is evidence by Robert Brawley, a colleague of mine, who showed that the reason there is no polarization on climate change in the United States is because the Republican leadership withdrew from the issue. And then the partisans followed suit. But it's not a natural law that Republican voters have to be polarized on climate change. It's because the leaders went that way. Now, if the leaders go the other way, interesting things can happen. Let me show you one example from recent the last two years. This is showing Republican approval of Vladimir Putin. Now, you may think that the Republicans, having been called warriors for decades, vilifying anything Russian or Soviet, that they really wouldn't like Vladimir Putin. And yeah, in 2015, they didn't. Only 12% gave favorable ratings of Vladimir Putin, less than Democrats. You know, the soft lefties who love anybody, they uh, endorse Putin 15% of the time, Republicans only 12% of the time. Two years later, Republicans went up by 20 percentage points to 32%. One in three Republicans now holds a positive opinion of Vladimir Putin. Democrats have gone down further. How could that have happened? Well, I think it's pretty obvious there's one guy who took over the Republican Party and who has more connections to Russia than most Russians have to each other. <laughs> and that guy uh, took along the Republican base, adding 20 points to the favorability reading, rating of a uh, foreign leader who's not exactly uh, friendly to the United States at all times. So if that can happen, anything can happen, I think. So how do we overcome post-truth politics? If I have another five minutes or so, is that about right? Um, well, let's talk more about leadership. I just said the Republican leadership matters. Um, yes, but how does that bail us out? Well, it bails us out a little bit because politicians, believe it or not, can be encouraged to be more honest. This is a study done by uh, two colleagues of mine who took about 1,200 state legislators across nine states in the United States, sent them multiple letters ahead of an election in 2012 outlining the reputational risk to them if they were caught making false statements by fact checkers. So they were put on notice Fact checkers are watching. You might lose an election. Watch what you say. And it was both Republicans, Democrats. You know, it was 1,200 of these legis. Well, 1,200 total. A random subset got these letter, these letters. Another random subset didn't get anything at all. And then their behavior was tracked by independent uh, fact checkers. And guess what? The ladders worked. These guys were less likely uh, to be caught out by fact checkers. So that is encouraging. Now, the only problem with this is that the study was done in 2012, <laughs> at a time when I think the world was slightly different. Whether this would still work now is uh, an open question. Looking at Alabama recently, I'm not so sure. Still, uh, we can't but hope. What else can we do? Well, there's a whole set of conventional interventions. What do I mean by that? I mean by that that it is possible through public education and in conversations um, to debunk myths, to update people's beliefs. I wrote a little handbook uh, on this couple of years ago with John Cook, which is available for, for download. And I just want to go through one quick example of what we've shown with this recently. We know that people are willing to let go of misinformation 
if certain conditions are true. And one of those conditions is that they have to be skeptical or suspicious of the motives underlying the initial information. Um, we uh, uh, exploited this in a study where we presented people with inoculation messages, kind of like a vaccination. We, we told people ahead of time, look, uh, there's massive agreement among climate scientists about the uh, scientific basis of climate change, but you know, the tobacco industry has been trying to uh, negate the same consensus with tobacco research for decades by creating this fake balance between you know, competing experts. Don't fall for that. And we then presented them with fake balance, the same participants, not the flat earth, but about uh, 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 climate. Had one guy there who was a contrarian, another guy who was an actual scientist. And it turned out that our inoculation messages neutralized the effects of false balance. So if people are warned to expect it, then you can do something uh, with it. The other thing we can do is we can tackle the communication structures. Very briefly, uh, this I would call techno-nudging. The Guardian, uh, the Google has started doing that. They are now experimenting with presenting fact-checking labels to show if news is true or false. Um, when you test this, typing in Obama birth certificate, you find that they still have some fine-tuning to do because uh, the top hits come from a website uh, that specializes in conspiracy theories, including uh, the, the presumed fact <laughs> that tofu uh, turns kids gay. Uh, and it's only at the bottom of the first page that um, Google pops up a fact check by Snopes. OK, so we're not there yet, but at least it, it, it is a start. Um, that's just one example of a general idea I call technocognition, which is that we exploit technology to um, facilitate truth over falsehood in online media without engaging in censorship. Here's one wonderful example I want to conclude with. Uh, there's a Norwegian site, news site, that is asking readers to pass a quiz about an article before they can comment. So if you want to leave a comment, um, do you want to comment? I think that's what, I don't speak Norwegian, but I'm guessing that's what that means. <laughs> oh yeah, just, just uh, pass this quiz. And then there, there's some multiple choice questions. So you have to show A, that you're not a robot, B, that you actually read the article, C, that you understood it, and D, it gives you time to cool down <laughs> before you leave a comment. Now, to my mind, um, we haven't validated this empirically, but to my mind, those are the kind of relatively small things we can do tomorrow that aren't censorship and aren't big brother changing anything, but that just make, make it more conducive for people to leave comments that are educated and truthful rather than false. But above all, what we really need, unfortunately, like it or not, is a fierce political battle to uh, deal with the current crisis. And I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs>
or, or in, in today's media, and that is the fact that if you have money, you can buy a voice. And it's, it's uh, the, the, the marketing-led media that we all rely on um, totally uh, supports uh, the views of, of the rich and the elite. And I, I think in one of your very first uh, 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 screenshots that you had up there, you showed how public media was more reliable than, than the private media uh, for, for oh, being truthful. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I, th I think that uh, it's, it's, this is my own opinion, but I think it's critical that we move to a whole new media system that doesn't, uh, uh, that isn't an amplifier for the rich, mm. like the messages of the rich, whether they're mm. lies or truth. Um, and I think that like this is a critical thing uh, in this whole issue that we need to have like uh, a big digital public library that is advertising free where no one can buy a voice and where we can we can be our own fact checkers we can we can decide for ourselves without having a machine or a corporation telling us what's right and wrong. Thank you. Well, I I agree. Um, I mean, yes, of course that. <laughs> There are so many things to talk about. And yes, media ownership is obviously one of them. And the slide I showed, you know, comparing NPR to Fox News is pointing in the direction that, you know, you're absolutely right. We have a, we have a problem there. Um, it's less clear to me how exactly you would deal with that. So, but, but let me, so therefore, let me put, put, a, put aside a response I might have because I'm really not sure about how to address that. What I am sure about we have to deal with is what I flashed up here, which is that um, at the moment, you don't even have to be Rupert Murdoch to buy a voice. At the moment, you can buy yourself uh, 5,000 Twitter followers for $29. Now, that's, you know, buys you influence. Because if you look at Twitter, one of the indicators of a, of a Twitterati's influence is the number of followers. And we know that during the Brexit campaign, um, there were several highly influential uh, tweeters for the, uh, for the Leave campaign, for the Brexit campaign, who turned out to be fake identities. Um, but they had hundreds of thousands of followers. And at first glance, they seem to be really influential. And politicians retweeted them, thinking this must be a really influential guy. He's got 100,000 followers. Well, he bought them for 100 bucks, those 100,000 followers. And the person was an avatar for some unknown uh, uh, something else sitting in the background there. So uh, before we even talk to media ownership, we got to deal with the fact that Facebook had 60 million fake accounts, and that 125 million Americans were exposed to disinformation during the last presidential campaign that was demonstrably funded by Russia, because they paid in rubles. So, uh, yeah. And it took Facebook a year to discover this. They first said, oh, there's nothing to see here. And then every three months, they released a little bit more. And now we know 60 million fake accounts, 125 million Americans exposed to disinformation. And it was paid for by Russia. And by the way, when I say Russia here, I'm not actually, you know, I don't think this is an issue of nationalism or different countries. It's just that Russia just happens to be the world's most perfect kleptocracy, right? And I think that is what makes Russia so attractive to people like Trump and the Brexiteers. It's not that they love Russia, but they love unmitigated kleptocracy and plutocracy. And that's why Russia pops up. It's not, you know, their funny hats or dances or something. It's, it's a much more tangible reason. Uh, we'll go uh, down. Here, the, whoops, sorry. <laughs> uh, when there was a gentleman in the middle and then up to Larissa. Are you next? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I agree with you on a lot of your points that you made, particularly about the, the problematic um, politicization of science that we're seeing. But one of the points that I want to ask you about and perhaps push you a little bit on um, is, is your response in terms of, um, seems to trade in a bit of a, 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 a 
somewhat superficial understanding of science and scientific consensus. And, and uh, there was an article that just came out in um, environmental communication that challenges this response of uh, we must believe in the scientific consensus because the, 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 uh, this Pierce et al. Uh, in response to Nor Naomi Oreskes. And I'm curious, just because I have you here, <laughs> of your response to that. And, and I know these are nuanced kinds of responses to all of the points about the politicization of science, but I'm wondering, at, on the left, do, is our proper response to, to show a somewhat naive view of science as if we should believe in the scientific consensus? Oh. And, and, and here you just, you had that slide with, you know, people on the left believe in GMOs. It's much more complicated than yeah. that. Yeah. Well, first oh. of all, uh, I, I'm, I'm not saying anybody should believe in science because if you believe, you know, it's not a matter of belief, it's a matter of evidence. So what I'm suggesting is accept the evidence. Now, as far as the consensus messaging is concerned, that's, uh, that's a very interesting point. And yeah, I'm familiar with that paper. I'm also, <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> you asked me, so I'll answer it. Uh, I mean, that paper also judiciously chose not to cite any of the empirical evidence that supports the idea that people are uh, uh, receptive to consensus information. So the claim in that paper was made, oh, we shouldn't mention the consensus because X, Y, Z. But it was completely devoid of citation to the relevant empirical data, which show that telling people about the scientific consensus, by and large, makes them more likely to accept the evidence and to do something about the problem. Now, I think, yes, that's, you know, there's nuance wherever you look, but in the absence of somebody having a degree in geophysics or the time to go to university and get a degree, knowing that there is a scientific consensus is, is a very good proxy indicator of the strength of scientific evidence. I mean, I rely on scientific consensus when I make decisions about you know, vaccinations. All the doctors, I mean, and spare me with, with these outliers there, all doctors know that vaccinating kids is going to be better for them than if you don't do it. It's as simple as that, no matter what it says on the internet. Now, I go by that, even though I'm not a medical doctor, because in the absence of anything else, I think that's a good proxy. And I think... Um, Notwithstanding all the nuances, I think underscoring the consensus about climate science is crucial for our communication efforts. And of course, the other side knows this, which is why they are spending a lot of time and effort trying to pretend that there isn't a consensus. And that's exactly what the tobacco industry did for 20 or 30 years. And the only reason we have tobacco control now is because the public ultimately woke up to the fact that there was a medical consensus and that the tobacco industry was lying to them about precisely that consensus. So I think uh, the scientific consensus is uh, a very important thing to talk about. And by the way, there's a lot of philosophy to back this up and a lot of analytic work uh, describing the circumstances under which a consensus is a reliable indicator of, of the strength of evidence. And, 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 and I can send you the papers if you're interested, but all of those conditions are met for climate science and uh, uh, vaccinations and various other issues. HIV, AIDS, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, lot of situations. Excellent. Uh, gentleman in the middle here. Ah, yeah, yeah uh, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely complex and compelling and uh, wow. Um, <laughs> I, I hope this is, uh, uh, fits the, the question. It, it's just that uh, on uh, one of the graphs where you showed the Republican supporters uh, going way up in the scale of not believing in consensus science, uh, are there any examples out there where, mm, like science has uh, failed by uh, establishing a consensus that these people can point to uh, to justify what they're doing. Oh, of course, you can go back to the, you know, uh, I mean, people always do that, of course, you know. They say, oh, but science has been wrong before. Yeah, 
Oh, of course it has. In the 19th century, you know, phlogiston was, was you know, thrown out, legitimately so, because it wasn't a particularly good theory. Um, uh, but really, if you, th if you look at the 20th and 21st century, um, you know, I'm actually not aware of any case where a strong scientific consensus all of a sudden turned out to be wrong, okay? Uh, there is some speculation, or there was some research actually to suggest that uh, before tectonic um, plates were accepted and tectonic movement became an accepted theory in geophysics, that, that the previous theory was consensually established. But in fact, that wasn't the case. In fact, that was not the case. There was always dissatisfaction with, I'm not a geologist, so I forget what the name for that was. But whatever preceded tectonic theory was never accepted as a consensus. Whereas tectonic theory now is uh, accepted as a consensus, and the evidence for that is overwhelming. The same with evolution. I mean, you know, things evolved. That's it. <laughs> They did, and the evidence for that is absolutely overwhelming, and so on, and so on, and so on. And I think part of the problem is that the people who are saying that are obviously doing this because they're pursuing an agenda, and they have political reasons to not like this particular piece of scientific information. But then they whip out their iPhone and make a phone call, and that's got the same physics in it as climate science. You know, and <laughs> we all accept that unquestioningly. So that's a very selective rhetorical tool, but it's a very good point. And, and yeah, um, I, I would love to hear of a consensus in the 20th and 21st century in science that has been overturned and replaced by a new theory in the hard sciences. Let's not talk about social science. That, you know, it's more, far more flexible. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a social scientist, but I... So we'll have time for about two more questions. Was there anyone on this side of the room that I might have missed when I was looking over this way that had a question? No? Quite thoughtful bunch. Microphone? Excellent. So up at the top with uh, uh, Larissa. Hi, thank oh. you, Stephen. That was really interesting. Um, I remember in the lead up to the American election, there was quite a bit of talk again with Russia, um, particularly around one of Putin's PR wizards, a guy named Sarkov. Uh, wow. He actually inspired Bannon and a bunch of Trump's henchmen, um, particularly around this Sarkovian method of disinformation, deliberately keeping people completely off kilter all the time. <laughs> it has a really profound effect in terms of just wasting a lot of our time sorting through what is true, what is not, and also has the a uh, um, balancing effect of, of keeping everybody in this state of overwhelm, guessing and unstable yeah. and uncertain. Yeah. Um, beyond alternative facts, there's also a quote that Bannon had in the lead up to the election, and I, of course I'm paraphrasing, and it said something along the lines of uh, the devil, crime, darkness, Nazis, what's bad is good for us uh, because it's unsettling for people and keeps them in fear. Uh, so I just wondered if you had come across this in your uh, research and what- Oh, absolutely, this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the shock and chaos in that bottom right quadrant that McWright and Dunlap came up with, I think is encapsulating that. It has a variety of different names, but it's basically this blizzard of misinformation and lies Especially when, when, when they're not even necessary. I mean, this is the fascinating thing about Trump. As far as I can tell, he lies even when he doesn't have to. <laughs> I mean, he could actually be truthful, and it wouldn't cause him any political harm. And he doesn't, right? He's still making stuff up. Um, and, and I alluded to this earlier. I, I think, well, I think by intuition, perhaps, rather than intellect. He, he is pursuing a very effective strategy because what this does is to undermine the ground. Every, we're in an earthquake of nothing can be trusted. And the moment you, you no longer think you can, uh, uh, you can discern truth, people are ready to, to believe anything, right? Because then, if nothing is knowable, I might as well slip into my comfortable echo chamber and just listen to Fox or read Breitbart or whatever it is, and I'm entitled to believe that, whatever it is I want, because nothing is knowable. And, and I think that's the real problem, and uh, that's what we're facing. Uh, down here in the front. 
I feel so excited and invigorated after your speech. There are days that I feel hopeless. You gave me not weapons of mass destruction, but weapons of it, get all this dumb information out of people's brains. I may even convince some of the rich men who are playing a dreadful role in my life. Not Good this luck. man. <laughs> yeah. So my question is, before I came into this room, I thought, okay, I know about leadership, and I know about misinformation, and I have studied sheep. I grew up on a farm, and I knew that sheep are very intelligent, and they follow the leader. And somewhere you said that there is still, yeah, we still tend to follow the leader, mm. and how to undo that. I'm thinking for a minute about fascism, but I will not go there. I just wanted to say, if you look at what Trevor Noah is doing in the United States, you know who Trevor Noah is? No, sorry. Trevor Noah came from South Africa, and he is now the great comedian who tries to... He is wonderful, he is powerful, and he uses a weapon that is called biting sense of humor. Yes. Because I have tried in my street and in my environment making these people look ridiculous if they say these yeah. statements. Yeah. And it does not always work, so I'm now trying to use, maybe you should stay here and help me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks so for, much. Thanks for the invitation. Um, yes, I, I do, re yes, I, I've seen some Trevor, no, now that you mention it uh, on, on YouTube or something. Um, yeah, I think humor is a fantastic weapon. You know, it's wonderful. If um, <laughs> the problem is you can only do it in an audience or, or in front of an audience where at least, you know, more than half the people agree with you because, you know, otherwise you, you fall flat in your face when you're trying, trying humor on an, uh, on an audience. So it's a double-edged rhetorical thing. But yeah, I mean, I know. You look at this stuff and you figure, how can anybody even believe this? You know, like this Pizzagate thing. The Democrats are running a pedophilia ring out of the basement of a pizzeria in Washington. I mean, who can believe this, right? And, and it is sort of, if it weren't actually happening, it would be hilarious. But unfortunately, not only is it happening, but one guy with a rifle actually showed up, right? in Washington and uh, looking for these children in the basement. So it is not actually funny. But yeah, if you can make people laugh at this, all the better. Go for it. Good luck. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, before we thank uh, Professor Lewandowski, just a quick reminder that um, if you have any of these plastic cups or any plates that you haven't returned yet, uh, please do so, because if not, uh, Parkland will be charged for them. So uh, make sure they get back to the place where they belong. And also, please join us at 5.30 at Dewey's on campus. It's not a uh, far walk away from here, and lots of people around who can help you find your way, but it'll be a great opportunity uh, to connect in a social setting over some beverages, perhaps, um, and get a chance to talk about all the very thoughtful things we've uh, heard today. So a big thank you to Stephen Lewandowski. Thank you.